Okay, in this session we're going to continue our series on uh, the doctrine of God. Decided to stand up for change, see if uh, it might could shake things up a little bit. And um, the topic for this session is the um, omnipresence of God, or the fact that God is everywhere. We're in the middle of the omnis. Um, his omniscience, his omnipresence, and um, his omnipotence. And last time we looked at his omnipotence, what it meant and doesn't mean. So let's jump right in. And uh, I'd like to read from Psalm 139, starting at verse 7. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted, knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance in your book, were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was not one of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake, I am still with you. Now I should point out that the last couple of verses shows us right response to the doctrine of God, and that is delight in Him. There shouldn't be any notion of an abstract study of God's um, attributes. This series is designed to lead us to reverence and to worship. And it was A.W. Tozer who said that whatever comes to our mind when we think of God is the most important thing about us. That is how we view God, how we conceptualize Him, how we understand His attributes, what He's like. That's the most important thing about us because it will determine everything. Our knowledge of God, our knowledge of heaven and hell, and everything in between. I'd like to read um, one other verse, and this is Solomon's prayer prior to the dedication of the temple. In 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 27, but will God dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house that I have built. All right, we are dealing with the omnipresence of God. Now this reminds me of several discussions that I had uh, over the years, people claiming <clears throat> that they had had uh, astral projections, and, and in so doing, they were almost boasting that they're able to be in more than place, more than one place at the same time, almost being omnipresent, so to speak, at least dually present. <clears throat> and I mention that because, well, that's becoming very, very popular, um, more and more popular anyway. And uh, how do we explain this idea of an astral projection, um, particularly in light of God's omnipresence? Well, uh, the more I have thought about it, 
the idea the idea behind astral projection is that supposedly the soul leaves the body and travels to Andromeda, California, wherever it is that uh, the person wants to go. Well, if that person does have a real experience in which they're actually seeing things, that is, they're actually having a supernatural visual experience, if that's the truth. Then let me tell you what's going on, as I have examined this uh, from a biblical perspective. What is happening is that a demon, just like they would implant tempting thoughts into our heads, they could also implant into a person's head a video particularly if they've opened themselves up to oppression and gotten that permission, legal rights. Uh, and if you're messing with the astral projection, you're giving him legal rights. Basically, it's like the insertion of a video into the person's brain. So they're actually seeing, they're not there where they think they are, but they're seeing what they're seeing. But it's a, it's a demonic projection into their head. Now, the reason why I know that they're not leaving their body is because, let me put it this way, theologians, uh, a big part of theology is making distinctions. And one of those dis most important distinctions is the distinction between a distinction and a separation. Let me give you an example. If I distinguish between your soul and your body, that just that's good. That shows that we're a, a composite being. However, if I separate this, your soul from your body, you know, congratulations, I just killed you. <laughs> because that's the definition of death, is separation of the soul from the body. So, with that in mind, we know that a person is who is asked, claiming to be asked or projecting, it, their soul is not leaving their body, because if it did, they'd be dead. Okay? So, that much I know for sure. Now, that's just a lead-in to the whole idea, because whatever's going on there, um, they're still only in one, two, three places, whatever they're claiming to be. It's, they're definitely, let me put it this way now, they're in one place. But even if that was true, <clears throat> they certainly are not omnipresent, which is what we are talking about. So when we talk about God's omnipresence, we mean that he is everywhere in space. Okay, when I talk about space, I'm talking about the entire cosmos, the vast, vast universe. And even though the temple and even though heaven especially is spoken of as being God's throne and the focalization of his presence, even that cannot contain him. Because as we read in this text here, because God is infinite spirit, his presence is everywhere. But in this first point, I just want to hammer home clearly that in God's created universe his presence is everywhere and that is precisely what david is saying in psalm 139 contrary to jonah he's not trying to flee from god he's saying that if i go to such and such a place you'll be there waiting for me and and he talks about sheol he's you know talking about death so, you know, for him, he sees it as a comforting truth, which for a believer, God's omnipresence is. And that's what I want you to take away from this, is that God's omnipresence is not just an academic um, fact. It's, it's supremely comforting. So God's presence is everywhere in space in time everywhere now um, the second thing let me, let me before I move on let me say it again 
In the Old Testament especially, there are places that are holy by virtue of the fact that God has declared them holy or because of the proximity to being in the presence of the Holy One where God declaring his temple or tabernacle as being the special place of where his name will covenantally dwell. But be that as it may, um, there are places of intensification of God's presence. But the, God's presence, never, nevertheless, is everywhere. And then secondly, we need to see that God's omnipresence entails that his presence is supraspatial. That is, he is the Lord not only of time, but also of space. That is, not only does his presence, not only is his presence everywhere, but his lordship and presence extends over even where there is there is no space and no time. Um, we are told, and I have to believe, that the universe as a creation is finite, right? Well, is God not Lord in the places where the universe has not extended? Of course he is. And then we know that God created in the finite past, um, and prior to that, it was nothing and God. It was God, and then there was nothing. There was no space, there was no time. We know, according to Scripture, that both space and time are creations of God. So that's what I mean when I say the um, super-temporality of God's Lordship and the supraspatiality of God's lordship is that before creation and after creation that from above and below God's presence is everywhere. Now especially the above part is, is a mystery but we have to affirm that um, God's presence is, is simply everywhere and we praise him for that and again we know that the universe is finite it's huge but that's not infinity now third point the medieval medieval theologians spoke of the immensity of god and this is a clear representation of biblical teaching what that adds to the notion of God's omnipresence is that it clarifies what it means to say that God is omnipresent. His immensity doesn't mean that, um, that he's huge. And when we say if something's immense, we usually mean that it's huge. God's immensity has to do with the fact that God is fully, fully present in every place. That is, God's not just in every place he's fully present in every place every one of his attributes in all of his fullness in all of his presence is in every aspect every square inch of the cosmos you know he's not seven pounds of him here and three pounds of him there no all of him is everywhere yeah, I'll say it again. It um, this has to do with how much of God is in any given place. It doesn't have to do with God's size. God is fully present in every place. Someone used the analogy of the body and and the soul. Um, no analogies can be very good, but I'll try this out for size. You know, the, the, um, it just, we're a body soul composite, as I referred to earlier. And our soul is not located here. It's not located here. Uh, according to scripture, it's fully present from, you know, from my fingers to my head to my toe. We're a body soul composite. 
Um, they want to discuss the, you know, whether we're body, soul, body, soul, spirit. And right now, just talking about the body, soul, body, soul, composite. And just as the soul is fully present in every part of the body, so that when we die, it leaves, and then at glorification, we're reunited uh, with our, um, our souls, our glorified body. It's in an, in an analogous way. God's immensity means that his presence is fully present everywhere. Now, don't get the notion, um, the panentheistic or pantheistic notion that the, you know, the universe is God's body. It's not. Um, one of the things that the omnipresence of God uh, needs to be seen against is the uh, ideas of open theism and process theology, um, which those heresies identify God with his creation, and, and that is blasphemous. Um, God is self-contained, as we talked about, his aseity, and he is not dependent on anything. Everything is creation. The universe is dependent upon him uh, for its existence. And he existed for backwards eternity, to use uh, that phrase, uh, long before he created the universe. So God is super spatial. He is immense. And then what, what is the response that should elicit in us? It should elicit all, as it did in David, as well as in King Solomon. Reverence, comfort. Because if you think about it, my friends, whatever your circumstance, and, and some of your circumstances and situations are pretty tough, and you're crying out, Lord, why and how long? But since God is everywhere present and especially covenantally present with us and, and indwelling us, yes, he does indwell us in a special way through the Holy Spirit. And that's, that's, an, addi that's an addition to his omnipresence, um, a clarification of it. Um, there, like I said, uh, there there are places where God intensifies His presence, and, and that would include um, His His children. But the the point I was going to make is simply that our ultimate and your your our ultimate circumstance situation is God Himself. He's the basic fact of your existence and the basic fact of your situation, because that's how close he is to you. He's closer to you than your very breath. That's the implicate of God's omnipresence. It may not seem or feel like God is present. We all know that by now. I've learned by age 62 that we can't go by feelings, that God's presence is often something that we have to cling to white knuckle with tears in our eyes. But God, as David said, and was so comforting is that, um, and he had a share of trials, that God is totally um, totally present with us in he's in the trials which means that God doesn't call us to rejoice for the trials that we're going in but he does call us to rejoice in them there's a, a wrong-headed teaching kind of what I call super spiritual teaching that basically asserts or implies that we should you know, praise God for you know, your child got hit or you got uh, pneumonia or whatever, and, and that's ridiculous. So the idea is you praise God that uh, that will accelerate, accelerate your healing type notion. And um, the word of faith heresy, which is what it is. 
most of the teachers on TV um, smiling and grinning are committing heresy as much by what they don't say uh, as by what they do say. But the uh, name it and claim it or the word of faith teaching, uh, that's just clearly heretical. And um, only in America, you know, could that type teaching come up. You could could come up with that in a place like Africa where most of the people live in poverty and that's the norm. So I have a my heart goes out to you if you're dealing with whatever difficult trials uh, you're in but just please remember that God is with you. That is the, the primary implicate of his omnipresence is how comforting it is to know that he is with us. He understands. He's our high priest. He's been through it and he understands. He's, he's wet many tears when he was on earth as we're told in Hebrews. And he has our undivided attention. My son has an important doctor's appointment tomorrow. He almost cut his finger off and thank God it, it's healed. He has an important appointment tomorrow. Uh, but with God, we don't have to have an appointment. We don't have to stand in line. You know, we were told in Scripture that he knows literally every hair on our head. And it's never going to be the case where he gets sidetracked by some especially bushy-headed guy counting his hair that he loses track of, of us. That's not the case. He is just as present with us in Greensboro, North Carolina, as he is in Moscow, Idaho, as he is with Moscow, Russia, or wherever it is that, that you live. God has your undivided attention immediately. And the what is a comforting fact for us is a terrifying fact for an unbeliever. Uh, it is a shallow understanding of hell to say that it's a, that's a place of being separated from God. I remember hearing that when I first became a Christian, that hell was a place where you're separated from God. That's not it at all. In fact, the hellishness of hell will be God's presence. Um, Satan as demons will add to the hellishness of it, as well as other people, and our own agonizing thoughts. But God will be there. He just won't be benevolent. What those who are in hell now and for eternity they will experience God's omnipresence uh, as the wrathful gaze of an infinitely incensed judge. And he's the one who will be torturing them. Very sobering, agonizing thought. And... Um, Hard to, hard to even speak after saying that. But we are not separated from God, even in hell. We can't. We can't. Um, if you look, don't have the time now, but if you look at Amos 9, verses 2 through 3, it's almost the reverse of Psalm 139 applied to an un believer, how relentless God's presence is for them. Some of the very same verbiage is used. But what is so supremely comforting for a believer is terrifying for an unbeliever, kind of unconsciously and deep down here, but then will be consciously in hell, is um, God's omnipresence. And that 
one of the most creative arguments against the existence of God, God was John Paul Sartre, who said that he couldn't believe in a God who um, everywhere he went, God was. It was like a celestial voyeur. Um, he couldn't get away from his, his presence. Um, feeling like he's naked all the time in his presence. And that's where we need the righteousness of Christ to clothe us. So, how do we summarize this doctrine then? One, only as an infinite spirit can God be omnipresent. Since God is an infinite spirit, he can be omnipresent. Two, God is not bound by space and time. His being transcends both. He's the Lord of time and space. Three, God's omnipresence includes his immensity. He is able to be fully present at all times and at all places, which means that all of his attributes are going to be present at all times. So that God's love is an omnipresent love, his, um, we, we think of his justice, is that is omnipresent, his wrath, that is omnipresent, his goodness is omnipresent, and the list, you know, could go on and on. And then we're going to apply those to other ones. God's, we talk about God's holiness. His love is a holy love, a holy goodness, a holy omnipresence, a holy omnipotence, and so on. Four, God's omnipotence is a comfort to those of us who are believers and a terror to unbelievers. And I want to make this appeal to you. I began, one of my first comments was quoting from Tozer, that what comes to our mind when we think of God is the most important thing about us. If when we contemplate the attributes of God, if it does not, in some everything else being equal, if we don't feel sick, you know, if we're not, don't have low blood sugar, and we're not excessively tired and all that, everything else being equal, if contemplating God's attributes, like His omnipresence and His omnipotence, His incomprehensibility, His love, His justice, and so on, if these don't bring us as they did to David. If they don't bring us to a, a sense of spiritual delight, like how, how precious to me are your thoughts. If there's not that sense of the moral excellence in which we delight in thinking and pondering about God. I mean, what higher thing or person can we think about than God? If that doesn't bring us a sense of, of, of pleasure, then we have to ask ourselves, are we truly converted? Because I, I, I know that from throughout all history, you see this in the Gospel of John with Jesus, that when it said people believed in Jesus, there's a qualification to that because it makes very clear that the people who believed in Jesus early on, that that was a false belief, it was an empty belief. And it's always been the case that the majority of preachers have been unconverted through the ages. And definitely the majority of people who profess to be Christians have not been regenerate. That saddens, saddens me beyond words. 
But that's the challenge that I feel led to lay out before you, is that on a positive note, studying the doctrine of God and His omnipresence should be a spiritual treat to us. If it's not, let that be a warning to you. Get on your knees and ask God to examine your heart to see if you're truly in the faith. Let's pray. Father, I know that our emotions go up and down and at one moment we, we could be feeling on top of the world and it's it's not right to think that um, our feelings are always going to be uh, in the heavenlies. It's just not the way life is in this fallen world. But nevertheless, if not as a general rule, uh, if pondering you doesn't bring us delight, then I know, Father, there's something wrong. And I pray for any of those who are listening to this who don't truly know you, that this would set them a seeking you, and that in seeking you, that they would find you, as your word says that they will. But thank you, and we praise you for the fact that you are omnipresent, and that you are immense, that you are fully present everywhere every second, even while we're sleeping. In Jesus' name.